Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O-Culture Podcast, where nothing here is true, but somehow it's exactly how things are. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for checking in, because there are not many more of these left, so the fact that some of you are still here means quite a bit to me. Our guest in this episode is Bob Frizzell. Bob is the author of, among other things, a book called Nothing in This Book is True, But It's Exactly How Things Are, which was just re-released with a 25th anniversary edition. Bob's work is something I stumbled upon several years ago, and this book specifically was pretty instrumental in shaping the young, inquisitive mind that I had at the time. And Bob's book is considered an underground classic in the realm of metaphysics and spirituality, and it explores everything from higher consciousness and human evolution to sacred geometry, the secret government, UFOs, Atlantis, and so much more. Although we're not going to get too metaphysical. So if you're here for UFO and Atlantis talk, this is not for you. This chat is more about the topics that more directly affect our everyday lives and how we can continue on the path of positive personal transformation. Because really, that is my primary interest here and always has been, and it turns out it's Bob's primary interest too. So it was nice to explore that common ground together. So let's take a few deep circular breaths and let Bob Frizzell guide us through the hidden hallways that make up the haunted house we all have living inside us. Enjoy. Bob Frizzell, welcome to the show, man. I have been a longtime fan of your work, so it's really cool for you to make some time for me to talk about the latest edition of maybe your most popular book, and we'll get into that in a moment, but thanks for being here. Oh, well, uh, you're welcome, Ryan, and... uh... Thank you so much for having me. I'm just, uh, you know, I get a chance to come on and talk about my favorite topics. Yeah, you bet. That's one of my favorite <laughs> yeah. things. I am excited. So I'm pumped. Let's go. I, I wish a lot of guests that I've reached out to had that same sort of mentality. I would have been able to schedule a lot more conversations like this. So, <laughs> Anyways, yeah, you would think people would want to talk about their work, but apparently sometimes people don't. So whatever. But anyways, so I mentioned the book. You recently released the 25th anniversary edition of what has become quite a classic, uh, let's call it metaphysical or spiritual text even. You know, most listeners yeah. probably know it. It's called Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are. Which, Bob, if I'm being honest, is it's a title that reminds me of the old Woody Allen film, Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex But We're Afraid to Ask. Don't know if you've seen it. Uh, although I think the similarities between the two pieces end with the title there. But the, uh-huh. uh, the, tw- the 25th anniversary of the book contains a, uh, a new preface from you as well as 10 new chapters. So it, it's quite different than the original version. And also I believe you put out a 15th anniversary book as well. It's, it's quite different from that too. And before we dig into the material... Uh, let's tell the audience just a bit about you and how you got here. I know you've told this story probably a thousand times, and I also know it's been quite a journey for you to this point, and that journey extends well beyond the 25 years the book has been in print. I also know from reading it that the journey begins maybe in a bowling alley somewhere or because of bowling. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> let's uh, set those proverbial pins up for us and tell us a bit about you know how Bob. The, <laughs> sure. <laughs> just tell us a bit about how how Bob the bowler became Bob the spiritual builder. Well, uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a good place to start, and uh, for sure it has been a journey. So to talk about my bowling career, Ryan, well, we have to go back in the day back into the early 1970s, in fact. And so at the time, my great goal in life, you know, fueled by a total burning desire to do whatever it took to be the very best bowler that I could be. And and so it was uh, my desire to be a touring professional on the the professional bowler's tour. So if if that's what you're up to, uh, you you better be pretty good. And uh, I quickly found out how good those guys were. And after a few tournaments, I began to realize that, you know, the biggest difference between these guys and me is that you, know, you take the pressure away and, you know, I, I can bomb strikes right and left just like these guys. But you add a little bit of pressure when you absolutely have to. And I found it much more difficult because, you know, at a time when you have to be calm, I would tense up. And yet these guys... They seem to have ice in their veins. And so I just started wondering, well, what's the difference here? Well, uh, 
talk about an adventure. I mean, I had no idea where this was going to lead, <laughs> but I, I shared this uh, this concern, if you will, with a with a good friend of mine. And for whatever reason, to this day, I still do not know why, but I'm really glad he did because he suggested to me that I read a book by an author by the name of Alan Watts. You know, he was a pretty popular guy back in the day. The title of the book was The Book. Talk about interesting titles. Mm -hmm. The okay. book on the subtitle was on the taboo against knowing who you are. And so I went and I got that book, Ryan, and I, I just picked that up and I couldn't stop reading. It was the most mind-blowing, most boggling, most expanding. Um, I couldn't believe what I was reading. It just began to open up a brand new world for me. And what was really happening was that even though, you know, most of the words just flew right over my head, there was an inner resonance, a very deep inner resonance that was reminding me, reminding me that, you know, I was more than I had considered myself to be. You and I and all of us are much, much more than we consider ourselves to be. So that just began an adventure that never, ever stopped. But what's that got to do with my bowling career? Well, <laughs> yeah, good question. We continued, and uh, my bowling game did begin to improve a bit, but it wasn't until a couple years later when another friend gave me three books. Now, I don't remember what the first two books were, but the third book was on meditation. I'm not trying to sell TM here, but that's what the book was about. And I picked that book up, and I was hooked there, too, so much so that I immediately went down and registered for the three-day TM course, learned to meditate, and that's when my bowling game began to improve dramatically because really for the first time ever, I could be calm in a pressure situation. It's just like time had slowed down. It was like in slow motion. It was just like, wow, this is amazing. And so, you know, that just began and it hasn't stopped because what I quickly began to realize out of all of this is that everything is a function of consciousness. In other words, that certainly includes improving your bowling game. If you want to learn how to be calm in a pressure situation, you better wake up and realize that uh, you need to learn to go within yourself. And in so doing, to find something that I previously just did not know existed, I didn't have any idea it existed, a whole new inner world opened up to me. And it just kept going from there. Yeah, and... Your bowling history here, your bowling career here, it resonates with me personally now because I play a lot of poker. Not like bowling at all, actually. But you know, in, <laughs> I used in, to play poker too. Sure, so. yeah. So in terms of like high pressure situations and feeling like the stress of that, especially yeah. in an atmosphere like a like a poker game where there's potentially a lot of money at stake too. Could you know, be. Yeah. yeah, there is. That pressure, I feel that. And I noticed like when I first started taking it seriously, I was playing in some tournaments and the first couple tournaments I played in for real, like real money, you know, like thousands of dollars at stake here, you know, I would tense up as well in certain moments. And then I found out not only did the more I play, the looser I became, but I found like a routine and a regimen that I would do, you know, prior to playing where it did involve some breathing exercises. And then I found out that, oh, well, you know what? I love binaural beats, for example. So I actually started listening to them during the games themselves. And it just kept me focused throughout the whole duration of those games, which can take hours upon hours sometimes. So to sit there and remain focused in a really sort of like heady intellectual way as well, in a mathematical way too, because poker is very much not about the cards, really. It's about odds and probability and also reading people's body language and things like that. So to be able to remain focused on that for hours. I have definitely found some benefit in some of the things that you're talking about here, meditation and breathing, which I know we'll get into later. Uh, and mm -hmm. even just like my yoga practice, which I do on the side here, you know, a few days a week when I can. So just those little things that you don't always see immediate benefits from them, but over the course of a few weeks or a couple of months, like it just starts to slowly build up like this sort of like energetic tolerance, I call it, you know, that you are more able to, to not only process things quicker, but also absorb things a little bit better and not allow them to stress you out so much, if that makes sense. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Makes total sense, because what you're talking about is presence. When the pressure takes you over and the stress and, and you tense up, uh, you're not present. You know, you are somewhere else, and it's not a good place if you want to produce the desired result. 
And so when you are present, on the other hand, you have a very high level of, uh, what was I going to say? You're I was going to, you're going to say, well, when you're present, you have presence. I mean, duh, come on, I can do better than that. <laughs> oh, well, I'll come back to that if, if, if that's important. But you're just very alert. I guess that's what I wanted to say. Very high degree of alertness. That's exactly what I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Now, you know, in the, uh, in the new preface, which I referenced earlier, you were commenting on where you think humanity is right now in their spiritual development and, and also where we may be headed. You went so far as to say, we will completely redefine what it means to be human. So Bob, I'm just wondering how exactly will we do that? What's the, what's the blueprint for that in your eyes? And, and also maybe more importantly, what obstacles might we face along the way to get to that? Ah, great, great questions. Well, I'm glad we got the time to talk about these things because this is going to take a little little bit of unpacking to, to really uh, take a look at it. And in the book, I do exactly that by suggesting uh, that we can't really know where we are. And we can't know where we're going either until or unless we know where we've been. And, you know, we have it, if you look at conventional wisdom, that everything began about 3800 B.C. in Sumer. And before that, A, there was nothing but hairy barbarians. And that uh, when we came out, we were the best and the brightest thing that ever existed on this planet. And uh, maybe that's not quite true. And so I make the case for this planet being a star seed with a minimum of a 500 million year history. And what I mean by a star seed, Ryan, is that I'm talking about beings from who knows where, other parts of the galaxy, from other galaxies, from other dimensional levels have come here at various times, and they've created brand new races. You know, a couple ET races get together, and bingo, then you've got a third race going, a brand new one. And at the appropriate moment, they all leave. And when they leave, they don't even leave anything behind. So there's a whole lot more going on here than everything beginning in 3800 BC. And in fact, there have been life forms on this planet that are so far beyond where we are right now that we can't even begin to imagine. Uh, in the book, I, I give a, a, an example of a Star Trek episode to, uh, to illustrate that point. And uh, so far beyond us that we can't even begin to imagine. For all you Star Trek fans, you might remember the episode where, <laughs> where, uh, where there was going to be a war between the Klingons and the, uh, the Federation. And so Kirk and Spock, uh, they land on a planet that was strategically situated because, you know, whoever controlled that planet would have a big advantage in this upcoming war. Uh, they came there to warn them, you know, that the Klingons are really bad guys. And when they come in, they're going to take you over. They're going to enslave you and all the rest of that stuff. But the uh, people on this planet didn't seem to be at the least bit concerned. And towards the very end of the episode, we find out why. It turns out that these were beings of pure light. They put on a humanoid face just for the convenience of the Federation, Spock and Kirk, and for, and for the Klingons. But they're beings of pure light. And at the end of the episode, uh, Mr. Spock summed it up quite clearly and succinctly when he suggested that these guys are about as far ahead of us as we are of the amoeba. And so, to me, that, that is so true, including ourselves. When we go back to the day in Atlantis and Lemuria, we were far beyond where we are right now in many, many ways. So to make the point, about 13,000 years ago, we fell in consciousness. And when we fell, we moved from unity, from heart-based unity. We moved from our, from our heart into our head, and we became our mind. Now, the problem there is that the mind is polarized. It doesn't connect the dots. It doesn't see wholeness. The heart only knows unity. It understands experientially that everything throughout the cosmos is completely interlinked, that there's only one spirit. There's only one consciousness moving throughout all of life on, on all different levels. And the polarized mind doesn't see this because when we are our mind, we're in a constant state of judgment. You know, we got this imaginary standard of how this situation or how this person should be. And if the situation or the person or the persons involved don't conform to that imaginary standard, 
Well, our overwhelming tendency is to make it wrong because it don't measure up. And so every time you do that, you're creating a conflict. And to carry that to the degree that as far as we have, I would go on to say, and I do make the point in the, in the book, that the biggest problem that we have is exactly that. It's our constant state of judgment. And so that's what leads to all the conflicts, both personal and, you know, uh, relationship-wise and between countries. And you can just go on and on from there. And um, got carried off a bit on a tangent there, so I kind of forgot what the original question was. <laughs> Maybe we should come back to that. <laughs> well, I had just asked you, you said that we will completely redefine what it means to be human. So I was just uh -huh. wondering, what's the blueprint for that? And what are the obstacles yeah. that we might face along the way? Yeah, right, right. Well, no question, we will and are being challenged. But there is an enormous infusion of higher dimensional energy that's coming on, that's coming down onto this third dimensional plane right now from fourth dimension and higher. And so it's impacting everybody on this planet. And to try and get some perspective on that, I refer in the book to a 26,000 year cycle called the precession of the equinoxes. And you can actually divide the cycle into two 13,000 year periods. Now everybody has heard, everybody, no, not everybody, but I suspect most people who are listening to this remember back in 2012, you know, what's all this stuff about 2012 and December 21st, 2012, and, you know, what end of the Mayan calendar, end of time as we know it, end of life as we know it? Yeah, what it was, was December 21st, 2012, was the last day in the old cycle of the 26,000-year precession, and the next day, December 22nd, was the first day in the new 13,000-year cycle in this precession of the equinoxes. Well, what does it mean? It means that for 13,000 years, we've been kind of like in a slumber because there's an awake cycle and there's an asleep cycle. And unlike the 24-hour cycle on our planet, where most of the beings in the cycle of darkness are asleep, and in the when it's light, most of us are awake, this cycle lasts for 26,000 years. So we've been in a deep slumber for 13,000 years, and we're just coming out of it right now, and we're starting to wake up. And because everything is a function of consciousness, and because everything is vibration, this higher vibratory rate of fourth dimensional energy permeating the planet is impacting everybody and everything on it. And the way it does it is it brings up anything less pure than itself. In other words, the darkness is starting to get stirred up. And so the whole game is learning how to harmonize with that darkness instead of resisting it. The whole game, in other words, in the process of moving back out of our mind, out of our head, and back into our hearts so we can see wholeness again, is exactly that. We have to learn that there is really... There is no uh, opposition. That's just a function of our polarized mind where we see good and evil. That here again, there's only one, one pattern of creation moving throughout all of the cosmos. Everything is completely interlinked. And what appears to be opposites, given our, the lens, the filter through which we're looking, and that's polarity consciousness, looks to us like they're polarized opposites. But in fact, what appears to be opposites are two different aspects of the same thing, and they're working together, serving as timing agents. And when the timing is right, consciousness moves. So we're, we're in for some big changes. So a couple things on that then. You use the term wake up in that answer. You use it in the book too. And I don't know how familiar you are with some of the language or the lingo thrown around on social media these days, but that term has been sort of transformed into the word woke they use it in the same way that you're talking about waking up, just becoming more aware of their surroundings, I guess, or, or what's going on in the world around them, or maybe even in themselves. But when you use that term, wake up, what do you actually mean by that? Is it just as simple as, okay, so I've undergone like this semi-spiritual transformation, and now I'm more aware of myself and what's going on inside of me and the world around me? Or is, is there like another explanation that, that I'm just not aware of that you may see that differently as? Mm, yeah, well, great question. We can have some, some fun taking a look here. I guess what I mean is that when we're immersed in polarity consciousness, the ultimate expression of polarity consciousness is, is being a victim. And a victim is someone who has no awareness of their creative powers. 
See, I, I, I assert and I make the case and I back it up kind of like step by step that you and I are creating our entire reality, every single bit of it, moment by moment. And in fact, we're creating it much more than you probably have ever imagined. And I mean, literally way out to the most distant stars. Yet a victim is someone who is so immersed in looking outside to outside authority to find the answers that they completely have given away their power and have no awareness whatsoever of the fact of what I just said, that they're creating their reality. And so what they've done is they've created a reality that makes them look like powerless victims. And, you know, kind of roughly the equivalent of uh, going and lying out in the middle of the street and wondering why all these cars are running over you. Everybody's just doing these really bad things to you. Well, the other side of that is to take full responsibility for your creative powers. And the only way you can do that, Ryan, is to shift the viewpoint from looking outside yourself to answers to beginning to explore the possibility that it is all contained within. And so contained within, when you start looking inside, and you see this is the big shift in me way back in 1972, and then two years later discovering TM, a whole new inner world began to, I didn't have any, you know, I was a victim, hey, you bet I was a victim. So it's like that. And uh, when you start looking within, then a whole new world begins to appear And you begin to discover that within you, you have a personal connection to source, a personal connection to all that is. And as you learn to tap into that, your creative juices, your intuitive powers begin to flow and uh, magic (laughs) begins to happen. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, Bob, like this podcast wouldn't exist if I did not have that sort of experience with myself a few years ago. You know, I had to really... Went through some interesting, you know, kind of traumatic personal experiences, and I was sort of forced to confront myself like that for the first time, really, in my entire life. And it definitely shifted a lot of things inside of me, and it shifted a lot of my perspectives, not only of just me, but also of my external environment at the same time. So I'm feeling what you're saying here, and I would love to argue it, but I really can't, you know. It's been my journey, too. So, really. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. Uh, a similar thing, well, I, you know, my version of it, in a sense, Ryan, for a lot of people, you have to be backed into a corner. That's definitely what happened to me. And I was backed so backed into a corner that there was no other way out. And so I was forced to make a decision that otherwise, had I not made that decision, certainly we would not be having this conversation today, writing books and doing what I do, no way. So for me, it was what happened in my bowling career was that uh, I hurt myself, not just bad, but really bad, had a back injury. And uh, like a dummy, tried to pretend it's not there and, you know, uh, grit my teeth and play through it and it only kept getting worse. And uh, initially, chiropractors were lifesavers, but, you know, diminishing returns quickly set in, and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. I wasn't going to go to doctors, heard too many horror stories about back surgery, wasn't even going to consider that. It only left one option, and that was to find a way to heal myself. And what I had as a result of my bowling career was the necessary entrance requirement, and that was the burning desire. See, I was willing to do whatever it took to be the best bowler I could. And I just brought that sort of an internal command, if you will, into the next phase of my life, which was finding a way to heal myself. And I had no idea where that would go or what it would mean or what it would lead to or any of the rest of that. Well, where it's led to is is uh, everything in between and where I am right now. Because I discovered that, again, everything is a function of consciousness. And I had to learn to go within and discover my own innate healing powers and did. Pleased to say, peeled my yeah. back to the point to like it's, it's, it's like it never, ever happened. But back in the day, I couldn't do anything. Well, Bob, that's why I play poker, because even with a back injury, I could still sit at the card table and you know be active in that. Yeah. So speaking of humanity, then, you talk in the book a little bit about our physical makeup. And I wanted to talk a bit about that here. You say that 
quote, even though it may not look like it, in fact, we are nothing but geometrical shapes and images, both inside yeah. and out, uh, end quote. And I don't think I would or even could argue that as well. But I do want you to convince me that this is true. You know, pretend like I'm a layman <laughs> here. Pretend like the audience that we know nothing about geometry or sacred geometry. What do you mean by we're nothing but geometrical images and shapes? And again, yeah. more importantly, how did you reach this conclusion? Well, it was shown to me. I'm probably not the originator of any of it. You know, I've taken it and built upon it and created my own and, and greatly expanded versions of it. But the whole idea behind sacred geometry is is exactly, well, uh, let me put it this way. That, uh, you know, I've talked about how we fell 13,000 years ago. And when we did, we moved from the heart-based unity. Our heart only sees unity. It only knows oneness. We moved into our head and became our mind, which is totally polarized. And so you've got the brain, the left brain and the right brain. Now, the left brain is the male side, the logical side. The right brain is the feminine, the intuitive side. And then you've got the corpus callosum running down the middle. And its job is to pass information between the two sides. But it can't because the two sides are in conflict. You got the left brain uh, looking out there, is looking at the right brain and say, you're nuts. There ain't no unity here. Everywhere I look, I see separation. I'm looking at a world that isn't me. What are you talking about? The left brain is not capable in its fallen state of connecting the dots and seeing wholeness. And so it needs to be shown. It needs to be shown in the only way that it can be shown, and that's logically that there is only one creation pattern moving through all of life, that there is only one image, and that uh, everything came out of that within waveform universe, and by extension, there's only one spirit moving throughout all of life. And sacred geometry is a language that's known throughout the cosmos. It's known everywhere. In some places, it's called the language of silence. Here, it's, I guess, just called sacred geometry. But you see, it is a language, and as such, it is capable of talking about anything, totally and perfectly capable of showing the mind logically, because, you know, geometry is pretty left-brain logical stuff. So it's totally capable of showing the mind logically that there is, in fact, only one creation pattern, which is absolutely necessary so that the mind, the left brain, rather, can come out of this separation and now it can, because it can begin to see unity logically, information can begin to be shared and passed between the two sides. And so there's a growth, a corresponding growth in consciousness out of separation and into unity once the left brain sees this, this wholeness. Now, that being said, it would be very, very difficult to really fully answer your question without being able to show you you know, a series of slides that go back down to and show how everything really uh, comes out of the sphere. Absolutely everything within Waveform Universe. I could, you know, give you the names of, of, of the many of, of the drawings that I've given in, in the book here, but I'm not sure it would have any meaning or have any impact. But I will say that in there, there is one particular system of information that is composed of 13 spheres or in two dimensions, 13 circles. And within this system of information called the fruit of life, there are 13 systems of information that describe this reality and everything in this reality down to and including absolutely everything about you, absolutely everything about you. And so the origin of the fruit of life is a sphere. It all comes out of a sphere. And in the book, I go way back to the beginning and speak of spirit being in the void between dimensions. And in the void, there's an absolute nothingness. I mean, there's no directions. There's no, there's no nothing. Total void. Now, if you're spirit in the great void, and if you moved, how would you know that you moved? See, there's not even movement unless, there, unless you move relative to something else. And so I just take it to the next step and kind of, you might say, solve that problem by the solution that spirit came across. And that was considering that we all have this innate ability. And that ability is the ability to project a consciousness beam, you know, say from your third eye. 
that you can, even in total nothingness, even in total darkness, if you, if you walked into a room that was totally black and you couldn't see a thing, and you've never been in that room before, so you don't know what's in front of you or anything else, yet we have this innate ability to project a beam of consciousness, if you will, at least a little ways in front of us and an equal amount in back of us. Actually, we can do it in, in six different directions, but just backwards and forwards, even if it's as little as an inch, you know that between you and an inch in front of you, or maybe a foot or a yard or whatever, whatever the distance might be, you know there's nothing there. But beyond that, you just do not know. And so using this, this is what spirit did in the great void, projecting these beams of consciousness. And when you do it in six different directions, you come up with one of the platonic solids, which is called an octahedron. And for those of you who, well, the Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, an octahedron is back-to-back Great Pyramids, okay? Now, movement is possible. And so the first thing that that spirit does is it projects itself on these axes, the X, Y, Z axes, and in so doing, by making one revolution, it creates a sphere. And so this is the beginning of creation. The whole point of this, what I'm leading up to here, is that spirit now begins to have a means, a mechanism, if you will, of moving out of the great void and moving into a created waveform universe. We're, third dimensionally speaking, a created waveform universe where everything is vibration, everything is energy. And in so doing, the basis of creation becomes this sphere and everything just projects out from there. So you have the five platonic solids, for example, We've all at least heard of those. Every, everybody was exposed to that back in high school geometry. The cube being perhaps the most well-known of the five platonic solids. Well, these five platonic solids are the building blocks of, create, of this created reality. And where do they come from? They all came out of uh, the fruit of life, this system of 13 circles that contains 13 massive amounts of information that explains everything in this reality. So the whole thing begins to take shape, if you will, when you could see it, if I could show you just a series of drawings here, as I've done in the book. And if you take the time to look at them and study them a bit, then I think, you know, the whole thing begins to unfold. But for the sake of just discussion, I I just don't know if we can go much further than where we've gone right now. But I hope this helps. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I'm just trying to tie that back to the aspect of the human form and how that really coincides Mm -hmm. with the creation of of human form. Is that the same general explanation or is there something more to that? Sure. Well, in in conception, you've got the the ovum that comes out of the uh, zona pellucida and then and then the union of the sperm cell. What is it? It's a sphere. And so then the first division, it forms uh, two equal spheres which is called in geometrical terms a vesica Pisces. A vesica Pisces is uh, two equal sized spheres or circles. And uh, you do it in such a way, if you're drawing circles, you know, you take your compass after you've drawn the first circle, and then you go to one of the points on the surface of the circle and draw another circle of the same size. And the shared area is called a vesica Pisces. Well, the Vesica Pisces, I mean, here again, is just, you know, the basis of most, if not all, of creation is contained within this image. Now, if you carry that a few steps further in this conception process, you very quickly get to the eight original cells, which are immortal relative to the rest of the body, are still there, and they are shaped in the form of two back-to-back tetrahedrons. Pure geometry so far. So what we've done is we've gone from a sphere the next progression would be into a vesica Pisces, pure geometry. The next progression would be into a tetrahedron, one of the five platonic solids. The next division gives you these back-to-back tetrahedrons, which is known as a star tetrahedron. And it just goes on and out from there. And so you've got this star tetrahedral shape at the base of the spine, and it just continues to go until you've got eventually all of the five platonic solids uh, shaped around the body. I mean, you can't see them, but energetically speaking, vibrationally speaking, they are there. And so we're nothing but geometry, if you look at it from that perspective. And so is anything and everything else. You're kitty, too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So you mentioned a lot of other geometrical terms in the book, and I wanted to know how they may tie back to, again, you know, like our physical makeup. Like, do we see expressions of these in ourselves? And I'm thinking of things like the phi ratio or the spiral yeah. or, or the egg of life or the flower of life. You know, are these yeah. terms and concepts, I guess, are they found anywhere inside of ourselves? I know they're found in nature quite a bit, and there are many examples that we could give, but I'm really focused on just the human being right now. Are we also an expression in some way of these very sort of heady mathematical and also spiritual concepts? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said they're found in nature. You're absolutely right. But you see, we are nature. How do you separate us from, from the whole? Well, you can't. And so you mentioned, for example, the phi ratio. Now, everybody's at least heard tell about the phi ratio. Basically, you take a line. You could take any line, no matter how long, how short. And there's a certain point in that line where if you divide the two together, the shorter one into the longer one, you get 1.618. 1.618-0339 forever because it, it has no beginning and no end. It's called a transcendental number. It's kind of like it came down from a higher dimensional. It doesn't quite fit here. No beginning and no end. But you see, we're nothing but phi ratio throughout our bodies. The bones in your arm, for example, are separated in phi ratio. The bones in your fingers and hands are separated by phi ratio. We got phi ratio and vesica Pisces and these good, good things all throughout us. The egg of life, well, those are the original eight cells. And uh, yeah, here, you know, we're nothing, nothing but geometry. And so it's uh, here again, it's like, you know, I don't, uh, I didn't write about this. And I, and I devote two chapters, mainly to, to what we call sacred geometry. The reason you call it sacred geometry is because it's used to show the mind that there's only one spirit moving throughout all life. So it's used to show the unity of being, in other words, then it's called sacred geometry. So I'm not, putting two chapters of sacred geometry in there for the purpose of teaching sacred geometry. Rather, it's for the purpose of showing the unity of life and showing how everything, absolutely everything, is completely interlinked and how what appears out there appears in here, how, in fact, everything is a smaller version of the whole. And you see, and that's the next progression, because sacred geometry is just a beautiful tool for showing you this holographic universe. And the one thing we know about a hologram is that you can take a hologram and you can cut it into, well, just say four equal pieces. You can cut it into a zillion pieces if you want. And in any one of those pieces, smaller pieces that you cut it into, if you shine a laser through that smaller piece, what you're going to get is a smaller version of the whole. And so out there throughout the cosmos, that's nothing but geometry. And in here within us, that's nothing but geometry. And you and I are a hologram. You and I are a smaller version of the whole. All of creation is contained within us. And so sacred geometry is just the perfect tool for showing you. And once you really see it, I mean, you know, talk about showing the mind that there is only one creation pattern, that there's only one image moving throughout all of life. That's a very, very powerful teaching tool. And this is the transformation that we need to make right now. I talked about this infusion of higher dimensional energy coming down and waking up and developing awareness, moving out of being a victim to being the source of life. If we are a smaller version of the whole and it's all contained within us, you and I are creating this reality, again, way out to the most distant stars. And so the more fully developed human, the more fully developed life form uh, is in full awareness of that and takes full responsibility for their creative uh, for their creative powers, learns to create it consciously, which is creating harmoniously. So, you know, it's stepping away, in other words, from this I'm better than you are and this us and them stuff and being more concerned for your own getting ahead than you are for the greater good of the whole and seeing the wholeness in all of it. Because if, if you and I, to harm another individual in any way is to harm yourself once you see the entire picture. And so, you know, we see this playing out. Come on, what good do wars do? What kind of a problem does that solve? If we don't move beyond that, we're not going to have a planet to play on for much longer. So, you know, push is coming to shove. And the great news is that we're going to make this transformation. We're going to make it through and we're going to completely define, redefine what it means to be human. So... 
You mentioned the cycles earlier, you know, the 13,000 and the greater 26,000 year cycles. And I'm just curious, you know, like if we go back to the 2012 date then, and we've, we've essentially are seven years into that next cycle, what do you expect to see in the next, you know, I don't know how old you are, Bob, but you know, in the next 30 years, you know, like if, if we're all still here, like what do you expect to see in terms of development on a micro level, just in your own life and on a macro level? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just the fact that you and I are talking about this sort of thing is a clear indication that something, something unusual is happening here. See, when I first started learning about this way back in uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, quickly discovered I couldn't hardly talk to anybody about this. I lost a number of friends. They all thought I was nuts. And uh, because of the polarized nature of our mind, They were on their own personal mission to prove how wrong I was and how right they were. You know, I was just some sort of a freak who could no longer be trusted, certainly could no longer be befriended and that sort of thing. Now I got tons and tons of friends who don't want to hear anything else other than what we're talking about. Times are changing. They're changing. They're changing rapidly. What's going to happen in 30 years? Well, the here again, the forces of darkness are beginning to come to the surface, very much so. And it's, you know, the analogy I would give for that is that here again, you go into a completely darkened room. I just had you there a few minutes ago, back into that dark room. Only this time, you know where the light switch is. Well, in the completely darkened room, you can't see a thing. But the moment you flip on the light switch, what happens to the darkness? It goes away. Yeah, right. So that's the whole point. Darkness cannot survive in the presence of the light. And so this enormous effusion of light, what it's due is stirring up the darkness, bringing it to our awareness, giving us a chance to revisit. And this time, instead of resisting it, to learn to expand, to include it, to learn to befriend it, and in so way, discover the wholeness in the situation, discover that, in fact, the darkness was just there trying to get our attention all along because it had a message for us. See, we go back to, you know, the how how this discussion began. I was a bowler, you're a poker player, and we both agree you can't do too well when you're all tensed up in a pressure situation. You have to develop some presence and some calmness. That's a function of consciousness. And so in the context of unity, you see, what darkness tries to do on a personal and on a cosmic level and anywhere in between It tries to instill us and keep us stuck in as much fear as possible. And when you're stuck in fear, you can't really move. And so what we habitually do in the state of polarity is we do everything we can to resist the fear. We make it wrong. Try and run away from it. Try and dig a very deep hole, see if we can bury it deeply enough. And you can't because you're burying it alive. And it's going to come with you and it's going to continue to haunt you for as long as you continue to resist it. So in the context of unity, you begin to learn experientially that the fear is actually there for a reason. It was, it was trying to get your attention all this time, but you never listened because you were too busy resisting it, too busy making it wrong. But in a context of unity, you now discover that by befriending it, by expanding to include it, you gain its message. And in so doing, you integrate or transmute that energy that was keeping you stuck into your sense of well-being. See, when stuck energy transmutes, the energy is now allowed to move again. And energy that is stuck keeps you stuck. Energy in its natural state is moving. And so when we're in alignment with universal principles, in alignment with life, the energy within us, the vibratory level, is moving. And it's vibrating at a much, much higher level than it ever could when it's stuck in the density of fear. I mean, fear, fear is vibrating at a very, very dense level. But when you've integrated, when you've moved through your fear and integrated into exhilaration and excitement and extreme levels of alertness, now you're vibrating at a much higher level and the energy is clearly moving again. And so everything, everything in this waveform universe is vibration. Everything is energy. And so learning how to cooperate, learning how to harmonize with life on an energetic level and recognizing that you and I are nothing but vibration, nothing but energy, and learning how to harmonize the stuck energy within ourselves 
is really the key, really the key to moving forth and, and, and discovering your own innate inner powers and your, your connection to all of life. Absolutely. And, you know, we're coming up towards the end of the free portion of the chat and we're going to transition into some bonus content for some subscribers in a few minutes. So before we do that, I wanted to make sure that we touched on for the free audience, your work in this discipline that you call breath alchemy. And you reference this many times in the book. There's several sections about it, several chapters worth of great information yeah. about it. I believe the first references to it, you call it rebirthing. It's this conscious breathing technique. But you now refer to it as breath alchemy. And, and conscious breathing techniques like this have become quite popular in certain circles the last 10 to 15 years with things like Wim Hof, the Iceman, and his breathing technique. It's a really popular thing amongst biohackers and like health and wellness junkies. So I'm wondering, like, what, what is the basis then for breath alchemy? You know, how does it work? How do you teach it? But also, how does it differ from things like some of these other popular breathing modalities? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, I've made the case for the biggest problem that we have. In fact, the source of all of our problems is the polarized mind and the fact that it's in a continual state of judgment. Now, anytime you make something wrong, there's two things going on here. Actually, it's one thing, but it's, there's, there's two aspects to it. One is there's the concept. You know, this thing or this person really is bad or wrong, and you believe you're make wrong. It's like, I'm right and you're wrong. You know, what's a good argument about, Ryan? Well, it's about I'm right, and it's about you're wrong. And how could you be so stupid as to not to see it? Make you wrong even a little bit more there. And so every time you do that, the conceptual component, and especially if you put some charge into it, and usually there is some pretty significant charge into it. Well, every time you do that, it's going to create a corresponding pattern of energy or a feeling in your body. Now, everything is vibration, everything is energy. And so these are really two different aspects of the same thing. There's the conceptual, the thought behind it, and there's the corresponding instantly created pattern of energy. Just call it a feeling in the body. Well, because the thought behind it is a make wrong thought that, and I'm really right and you're really wrong, you know, I put some charge into it and I'm holding on to that, the corresponding feeling can only be an unpleasant feeling. And in our polarized separate state, we've learned, and because we have a very strong desire to feel good, we've learned that the best way to try and feel good is to do everything we can to bury that unpleasant feeling, you know, to resist it, to fight it, to pretend it's not there, to be in denial, which leads to compulsive and addictive behavior, by the way. And so what it does considering that in our polarized mind, when we totally identify with our mind as we have, we've made a whole lot of things wrong in our life, right? Whole lot to make wrong. And what that means is that every single time you do that, you get this stuck pattern of energy that you fight and resist and pretend isn't there and all that. And the body becomes just a huge reservoir of all of this stuck energy, and it doesn't feel good. And if you don't learn how to deal with that stuff consciously, it's going to start handling you and it's going to start popping out and like aches and pains and arthritis. And, you know, I am totally 1000% convinced that all illness, underlying all, is a direct result of our inability to deal with all this stuck energy that's living in the body. Well, what breath alchemy does is it uses a breathing rhythm that I call circular breathing. And the circular breathing enables you to access life force energy, which is prana, which is source energy, the purest, the most powerful energy in all of creation, the energy of life. And so you get all this energy of, of creation, source energy or prana moving through your body. And so it's beginning to do its job. The job being, number one, you feel an increased energy flow throughout your body. And secondly, these little packets of macron that have been stuck, suppressed way deep down in your body, they start lifting up one by one to give you an opportunity to revisit them. So instead of making war with them, instead of trying to resist them and fight them, you tune in to feel that energy, to feel that sensation. In other words, you make peace with instead of make war with it. And in so doing, 
it enables you to have a thorough experience of the very packet of energy that you've been resisting probably for a long, long time. And in so doing, the thorough experience of it in a context of acceptance enables it to integrate into your sense of well-being. Or another way of saying that is that the energy transmutes, meaning what started out is feeling like an unpleasant pattern of energy. The transmutation is such that it transforms itself into a very pleasant, very positive uh, energy sensation in your in your body, and you end up feeling great. A session takes usually in the neighborhood of an hour, maybe maybe up to an hour and a half or so, and uh, people are just absolutely amazed. You know, basically what they're saying is, I didn't know it was possible to feel this good, to feel just this clean and this wow, it's just amazing. And and uh, that's no exaggeration. This is what I get over and over and over again. So that's just kind of like a quick thumbnail sketch of what breath alchemy is. It's it's a way out of the mess that we've created of polarity consciousness and creating a bit of unity within ourselves. And so once you create it within yourself, that in combination with having shown the mind through sacred geometry, the holographic universe and the unity of life, and then you begin to get it experientially by transmuting all the stuck energy into your body, into very useful, very pleasant feeling energy. Well, a whole new possibility, needless to say, begins to emerge. And the transformation that I talk about in the book that's absolutely necessary is certainly the vehicle that I've used and uh, have, have taught many, 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 you know, literally thousands of people uh, to do likewise. So it's powerful stuff. It's real stuff. Yeah, it is. I haven't tried it yet. But, you know, when I was reading through that section in the book, it really spoke to me because I am right in the middle of something like that, that that transformative period with that stuck energy and these sort of traumatic experiences that have been rooted and sort of suppressed, you know, at the same time. And you're forced to confront them so you can, again, transmute them, like you said, or better integrate them into your, your life now so it, you're not, I don't know, I guess I don't well, feel so Well, that's the opportunity. Yeah. That's the opportunity, Ryan. And then add to that, as I make the point, the enormous infusion of higher, higher vibratory energy coming down from the higher, from the higher dimensions. And what it's doing is stirring up the darkness within each and every one of us, giving you an opportunity to revisit it. Now, in the absence of any, of any training, what most people are going to do is they're still going to resist it. You know, to be given the opportunity to revisit the stuck energy as it comes up, most people, in the absence of any awareness, expanded awareness, are still going to make it wrong, still going to fight it. In fact, they're most likely going to blame the person who came along and served as a trigger situation. You did this to me, you know, just revert back into victim consciousness. But all that's going to do is keep you stuck. And so the way out is always a function of consciousness. There's never an exception to that. And, uh, you know, the great teachers have understood that for a long, 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 long time. And they've been trying to tell us that. So finally, you know, we're starting to get the message. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a bit more about Breath Alchemy in our patron extension. So before we get to that, Bob, tell our free audience who we're going to let go here uh, where they can find the book and where they can keep up with you and your work. Well, you can go to my website, bobforself.com. To get the book, just go to Amazon. Nothing in this book is true, but it's exactly how things are. And it's the updated 25th anniversary edition. It was just released on June 25th. So it's brand new, just, just out there. Now, we had a great launch. And uh, that book is the number one new release in both metaphysics and in Mars. It's also way up there in other areas, too, like unexplained mysteries and history and uh, <laughs> unconventional history, I might add, uh, and UFOs. <laughs> so it's, it's catching on nicely. The original version, I might add, has, you know, over the years sold a half a million copies. It's printed in 25 languages. So the word has gotten out. But this new edition, and plenty of people who have read the earlier editions have reported back to me that, you know, this reads like a brand new book, because really it is. I discovered the trick after, you know, researching many, many authors, especially the more prolific ones, that what they do, you know, there might be as little as 10 to 20 or 30 percent in their brand new book that's actually new material. The rest of it is the same, you know, the things that they had presented previously is just rehashed and presented a little bit differently. And that's what I did with, with this book. So I kept the same basic message intact, but added to it. 
you know, all of what I've been learning and practicing and preaching for the past, uh, well, <laughs> for the past many years. So I'm really pleased with the book. The early returns have been fantastic and, uh, well, I'm having a lot of fun. That's what it's all about, right? Just having some fun. (laughs) So, man, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. I really dig you and your work and your style and just you're one of the OGs of of this. And you're one of the guys that really got me (laughs) into this stuff at the beginning of of my journey here. So it's really cool to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you. And Ryan, I just want to say... uh, Thank you so much for having me on. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed this talk immensely. You know, uh, most of the interviews I do, people want to know about the big picture stuff, what happened in Atlantis, where we're we going, and all the rest of that. But you want to talk about the stuff that is really true and near and dear to my heart, and that's the personal transformation, and specifically the breath alchemy technique. So thanks so much for the questions you had and for have asked and for the direction that you've taken this. And I've really, really, truly enjoyed uh, being your guest. So thank you. Man, I you are way too kind, but I do appreciate that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, to me, the the Atlantis saga, Lemuria, ancient alien, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all interesting. It's all thought-provoking on some level. But where's the practicality of that to my life? And I think that that's why I wanted to focus <laughs> more on <laughs> breath alchemy and some other things like that. So the personal transformation stuff, I think it resonates with everybody. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Ryan, and take care. And there you have it. My thanks again to Bob Frizzell. Really, really enjoyed speaking with him and really enjoyed digging deep into the breath alchemy stuff, both in the free portion of the chat and the Patreon extension. And I like that angle into all this because it's practical. We're all breathing air here and controlling your breath is a lot easier than controlling the actions or reactions of another person or the news cycle or whatever the hell is going on. And you can test it and see if it does actually work. And if it does, hey, you just found yourself one of the original biohacks. No supplements needed. And if it doesn't work, oh well, no harm, no foul. On to the next thing. But that's why I stayed away from the UFO, Atlantis, Lemuria stuff, which Bob does write about extensively in the book. That's just not my thing anymore, and I don't know what good comes from discussing it these days. Everyone seems to be talking about UFOs now anyway, and, well, that's my cue to unplug from it and look elsewhere. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, we talked about universal law and the three basic principles of breath alchemy. Also talked about how suppressed energy affects our breathing, syncing your breath with other people, and what comes from that. Heart-based unity, modern conspiracy culture, and what that says about humanity's path forward. And we ended with what the title of the book actually means to Bob. And you can hear that extension and all others at patreon.com slash occulture. I think I started the extensions at episode 77, so if you're looking for when the Patreon bonus material actually becomes a thing... It's with that episode, with Jason Louv, I believe. And a shout-out to new patrons, Philip, Scotty, Adon, and Diane. Thanks so much for showing me some love, all things considered. And to all you guys still supporting the Patreon, that's just really cool of you, and so nice. And I don't even know how to repay all of you for the ongoing support. I just hope you take something actionable from all this material and use it to make a better life for yourself and for your loved ones. That's really what matters here. Who gives a fuck about Atlantis and UFOs when people are sick and struggling? And speaking of struggling, my struggle for time is real, which means I gotta bounce. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
behind this cassette.